Good afternoon. I guess I'm the moderator for this event today. I want to thank you for coming, and I want to begin by acknowledging um, Dakota Electric and the individual donors who have supported this event, um, and especially Hastings uh, Public Schools who partnered with us on this event. Um, without that assistance, uh, we would not have been able to pull this thing off. But we are still a little short of our goal. So, um, if you are so inclined, we will be asking for donations on the way out. We'll have a couple of buckets at the door. You can drop in, um, um, you know, um, some, some money if you feel like it. And uh, so, on behalf of Thrive Hastings, I thank you for, for that. Um, we are going to do, um, hold off on any Q&A until the end of the program. Um, we've got several speakers here, and I don't want to keep you longer than um, we should. Um, so hang on to those questions, remember them, and we'll try to fit them in. When I moved to Hastings in 1987, I remember thinking, gosh, this seems like a white place, um, especially for a town um, so close to um, the Twin Cities. But I also knew I felt comfortable here and didn't think much more about it. And it took decades, um, uh, you know, for me to come to the realization that um, neither Hastings demographics or my comfort level with whiteness um, were naturally caused or benign. I, at the time, I did not know that Hastings had a thriving black community that included their own black church. I did not know that this group of black pioneers included several noteworthy individuals, leaders all, who supported their families and labored to build a more perfect community and a more perfect union. I did not know that early on, the white community of Hastings welcomed these black pioneers, tentatively and imperfectly to be sure, but they did welcome. And I could not understand how this healthy black community could fall apart and diminish so quickly. So what happened to Hastings? What happened in Hastings? I was stumped. And then a friend recommended that I should read Sundown Towns, A Hidden Dimension of American Racism by Dr. James Lowen. And as soon as I finished the book, I began plotting to bring James Lowen to Hastings. And so it's with real pleasure and pride that I'm able to introduce uh, Dr. James Lowen to you. Jim is a child of the Midwest, born in Decatur, Illinois, educated at Carleton College. He went on to earn a PhD from Harvard University. Um, he has authored many books, probably about this many books, um, a couple of which you may have heard of, including Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History te Textbook Got Wrong, and Sundown Towns, um, A Hidden Dimension of American Racism. So far, I've read two, two of his books. His writing is lively and engaging, and I'm happy to write a uh, report that his personal style is also. I think we're in for a real treat. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lowen. This thing is supposed to be on. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Very good. The system works. Well, let me say I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm excited to be here. There are very few towns that I go to that are actually facing their some downtown past and doing something about it. And, and so I like you all that. Okay. Uh, yesterday I spoke at the, I'm going to brag for just a minute. Yesterday I spoke at the Minnesota Historical Society, also known as the museum. And it's, we were sold out, and I got, I got a standing ovation. Um, but what was interesting about it was their reaction to a little quiz that I'm going to give you. Um, I'm not sure, I guess I don't know that there's a clicker here, so I'll just stand here and do it. Um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a uh, national movement 
I, I guess they have to call it movement, even though it was retrograde, it was in the wrong direction. Uh, my, my bestseller, my son teacher told me, which is a bestseller, continues to sell just really well, um, is uh, an analysis of 18 high school history textbooks. I'm the only American ever to have read 18 in high school. In high <laughs> it was a near death experience, you know. Uh, oh, they are so boring. Most, well, all of them almost. Um, and they all, one of the reasons they're so boring is they all tell the same overall story. And the overall story is very simple, and I can represent it right there. Well, maybe this way. We started out great, and we've been getting better and better. On we get up, we're kind of automatically. Well, that's even if it were true, it would still be boring. And it kind of removes any sense of agency on the part of high school students. I mean, you can, you should vote, good citizens vote, but other than that, I mean, do you really need to do anything? Do you need to protest anything? Do you need to even write letters to them? Well, no, because we're we, because we started out great and we were getting better and better. Well, in a number of fields, maybe in all fields at some point, we did. We went in the wrong direction. And certainly we did in race relations, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And so Hastings' journey is America's journey. Okay? The only difference is you folks are facing up to it, and America's still working on it. All right? um, so I'm going to start by showing you a part of the problem, at least I think I am, and I may not, and I hope I don't. That is to say, I'm going to give you a question. Um, that's the question. Why do we have a civil war? And the reason I put the second question down is because, of course, your answer to the first one would be, well, well, then we had a civil war because the South seceded. And, and I would say, well, you've got a point there. Uh, so then I'm really asking, why did South Carolina, followed by 10 other states, Leave the Federal Union. And if I've done this actually, I've asked it at great length, and I get four alternatives always, but I'm not going to take that time right now. I'm going to tell you what the alternatives are. The South seceded for slavery. The South seceded for states' rights. The South seceded because of the election of Lincoln, and the South seceded over tariffs and taxes or issues about tariffs and taxes. Oops, the, I'm looking at the wrong screen. There they go. We, meaning you, are now going to vote. I'm going to kind of go up here. It's really hard to see you. There they go. It's really easy to see you. Um, <laughs> it would be cool if everybody would from, get from there down in here. That would be really cool. <laughs> All right. Are you ready to vote? We're not going to discuss it, so you better be ready to vote. Um, out of the light of that, so I can see you better. The South seceded for slavery. Hands up. Now look around. Hands up. Don't forget other people this before you vote. For that shit. The secret ballot. I'm going to count. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. One person is going like this on his nose. 14, 15, 16, 17. What, what do I do with that? Okay, 17. The South seceded for states' rights. Hands up. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. Are you guys remembering that? I, I should be writing it down. Seventeen. 24. The South seceded because of the election of Lincoln. One. Feels pretty stupid, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. We'll get back to you. Uh, the South seceded over tariffs and taxes. One, two, three, four, five, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so we got, what did we get? 17. We had a definite majority. Was it 22 or something like that? 21 for state rights. All right. Let's see how that compares to how it used to go nationally. Not too far off. I would say 21 out of all of those would be about maybe 
48 percent, but less than that, but close to half for state tracks. So it was maybe something like, I mean, I'm not doing the math right now. It was maybe something like 38 percent, 48 percent, one guy, and this was maybe a little higher, right? It's in here someplace. Something like that. Not too different. Well, how do we do history? If I were teaching this, and I might even do this tomorrow in your high school, uh, I would, um, I, I'm, I, I, what flashed into my mind was, don't tell your students, that is, those of you who have children in, in the school and so on, uh, about this season, about this election, but I, but I took it all back. If, if you want to tell them the right answer, I think very seldom the parents actually know anything as far as kids are concerned. <laughs> so why don't you go ahead and tell them? <laughs> um, that would be good. Uh, maybe they'll maybe they'll do better than you did. Oh, uh, my my question to them might be: How do we do this? Do we go by majority rule? If so, then the answer is states' rights. Well, states' rights didn't quite get a majority, but it clearly got a plurality, right? Okay. And then nationally, it clearly got a majority. Uh, well, is that how we do history by vote? No. no. We, what do we need? Facts. I heard several people think that. Facts would be good. And we could talk about how we get those facts, but let's just, this isn't that exercise. I'm doing something else today. So let's say that the very best fact is this document. This is a book I wrote with another guy called The Confederate and Indo Confederate Agreement. Right? And it's got all of these states exactly why they seceded. Beginning with South Carolina, which on Christmas Eve of 1860 passed the following document uh, in its secession convention Quote, Declaration of the immediate causes which induce and justify the secession of South Carolina from the Federal Union. Could that be relevant? That's the smoking gun, right? And so what do they do in this document? Well, they start with about two and a half pages that is kind of a constitutional history of the United States that leaves out the Constitution. This is not easy to write, and it bears some study because it's how to obfuscate, how to write really bad history, but never mind, okay? Then they get to why we are seceding, and here's what they say. They say, we assert that 14 of the states have deliberately refused for years past to fulfill their constitutional obligations, and we refer to their own statutes for the proof. Now, constitutional obligations, that's pretty vague, but they go right on to say what they mean, and they write, the Constitution of the United States, in its fourth article, provides as follows, quote, no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Now that's the what. What is that? Fugitive slave act. Fugitive slave clause. And it was followed, of course, in 1850 by the Fugitive Slave Act, which is the most draconian federal law absolutely anti-state trade. In fact, it sets up a federal court to supersede all state courts on this matter. And so if you think you have a fugitive slave that you caught in Pennsylvania or in New Hampshire or Minnesota or wherever it is, uh, you take it to this federal court, you don't mess with the states. They go on to say, so South Carolina is anti-state trade, isn't it? Think about it. They go on to list the states that they're upset about. And I, I'm about to quote it as soon as I Here we are. The states of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, dot, 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 they go west. Wisconsin and Iowa, they leave out Minnesota, they're not upset with you, but they list 16 states, um, have enacted laws which either nullify the acts of Congress or render useless any attempt to, to execute them. In many of these states, the fugitive is discharged from the service or labor, blah, blah, blah. So they're upset with the North about states' rights. And in particular, they're upset with the North when it messes around with fugitive slaves. 
They also are obsessed in North, New York for, uh, with northern states for some other reasons. For instance, they are obsessed with New York because New York no longer allows what is called temporary slavery. It used to work like this. Let's suppose you're a rich white family from Charleston. Uh, you don't want to spend August in Charleston. It's hot and muggy. Uh, you might want to see some plays in Manhattan, or you might want to go to the Hamptons. But you don't want to do your own cooking. You don't even know how. Uh, so you bring your cook along. New York is now saying, uh uh, we're trying to run a free state here. If you bring your enslaved cook into New York, she goes free. South is outraged with this, and they say so. They're outraged that New Hampshire and some other northeastern states, New England states, for letting black folks vote. Now, who votes in America was a state right in 1859 and 1860. The voting rights part of the Constitution is the 15th Amendment. It gets passed during Reconstruction, two whole eras later, right? After the Civil War and then during Reconstruction. We're before the Civil War. So who votes in New Hampshire is none of South Carolina's business. But they make it their business. And they actually have a point because they cite the infamous Dred Scott decision. I hope everybody in Minnesota knows the Dred the Scott decision. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> Some guy in the middle of the Okay. Um, they cited the Dred Scott decision with its infamous clause that black folks got no rights that white folks need to respect. And here you people in New Hampshire are letting them vote. This is an outrage. So there are good states rights on a number of things, any kind that touches on race relations and slavery. Okay? Maybe other things too. And yet, 65% nationally, up until recently, and about 48% of the folks in this room said that the South seceded four state rights. This is 180 degrees wrong. They are specifically saying why they are seceding, and they are listing the states, and they are listing the rights that really upset them. Okay. And what they're saying is that seceding four, you've already heard, it's clear. They are seceding four slavery for the extension of it, for its maintenance forever. Okay? And the one guy who said Abraham Lincoln, that's not wrong. Okay? And they say so. Uh, they are hit. It's a trigger. It's not an underlying cause. But they actually mentioned this new, they call it the Black Republican. I actually checked. He's a white Republican. <laughs> but they are upset by him. And why? Why are they upset? Because, as they say in this document, he represents a new sectional party that is against slavery. So it all comes back to the escort. Okay? Now, what about tariffs and taxes? That was an issue in 1830 31. No issue whatsoever in 1860 that we were operating under one of the lowest tariffs we ever had. And the tariff had been written by a plantation owner from uh, southern Virginia. Not an issue. So now we have the interesting phenomenon that when you add together the people saying states' rights and saying tariffs, we get a clear majority that we get about 65% of this audience. They get it completely wrong. And here we are, 100, more than 150 years after the start of the Civil War, right? That was 2015 or 16. So, we're 153, four years after the start of the Civil War, and we get it wrong. How could that happen? Well, I want to suggest that the way you uh, look at that is, when did it start to happen? When did we start getting it wrong? And let's look at it that way. Uh, at the next slide, however, you can hear me okay in the back? Okay, just check it. Well, it started... It started happening even before 1890, but it particularly got set between 1890 and 1940. And this is an era in US history. Of course, you can set up your own eras the way you want, but this is called the nadir, or nadir, both ways are fine, of race relations. Now, nadir, we're not talking about alpha, right? You can see how it's spelled. Uh, nadir is an uh, English language word that means the opposite of zenith, right? The low point. The nature of race relations. And that's the period, 1890 to 1940. And I want to show you some pictures about what happened in the nature and how the entire United States went worse and worse and worse in race relations during this 50 year period. 
And I'll get to that in just a minute. But let me just ask, what was its purpose? And by its purpose, I mean, what was the purpose of this complete lie that the South seceded for states' rights? See, at the time, everybody knew because of all these statements, they said why they were seceding. If you think about it, um, you, uh, here's, a, here's a homework assignment. Okay? I want you to go home tonight and bring up on the web or wherever you bring things up uh, Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural. And you will see that at a certain point, he says, and all knew that slavery was somehow the cause of this great conflict. Now, I'm just quoting him slightly. He actually says, all knew that this great interest, but he had just been talking about slavery. So that's why I removed the pronoun, this great interest in being slavery. <coughs> and he's speaking that in March of 1865 when he's getting inaugurated for the second term. And all did know that slavery was there. He's not saying that in order to get anybody worked up. He's saying it so he can change the subject of this short but the very powerful and important address. He's now going to talk about slavery. And when he goes on to talk about, when he talks about slavery, in two very long sentences, it's the most searing and important statement about slavery ever made by any American president. So please go home and read the second inaugural and think about it tonight. But what I'm saying about it is everybody all knew in 1865 that the South seceded for slavery. But by 1890, they were beginning to forget. And the white South, the United Daughters of the Confederacy and the Sons of Confederate Veterans and those people started this complete lie that just turned history on its head and said, and said we were seceding for states' rights, the exact opposite of the truth. All right, so what was the purpose of saying that? Well, it certainly rationalizes and defends I shouldn't say the South, I should say the white South, in fact, I should say the white Confederate South, because there are plenty of white Southerners who were anti-Confederates, but anyway. Why did the North put up with it? Well, because we didn't have clean hands. We are becoming more and more complicit in white supremacy ourselves in the North after 1890. And we see this in a whole bunch of ways because the major sets in. And the reason I started out with this little exercise then is to show you that we are not done with the nigger, even in Hastings, Minnesota, and even in 2019. It's still got its dead hands of ignorance and wrongness in our minds, in, on the back of our neck in the case of what I just did. I got a cold hand, too. Uh, this is a picture, a, a chart, if you will, of racism, okay? And it is the worst such curve ever devised and I know because I devised it. And on the left, you will see that there is not even a unit. There's no units. It's just impressionistic. At the same time, it's also the best such chart ever in my because You've never seen this before, have you? But you can't mind it. Oh, I haven't seen it. And you can literally see the data in the form of this, I kind of like the way I can point it, in the form of this very high uh, increase in racism, which takes place right here in 1890, okay? Now, I can't give you a whole lecture on race relations history in the United States as to why, why that's so, but let me just show you some pictures of the nadir, and in, as I show you the pictures, I will talk about the three underlying causes that cause racism to shoot up um, in, at the end of 1890 and then to remain high uh, until 1940 and, and still somewhat lower Re more recently. First, we have a picture before the name. This is a cartoon by Thomas Nast. Thomas Nast, you know, is the most famous cartoonist, most important cartoonist in the history of the country, for sure. He helped develop, he developed the idea of Uncle Sam, Santa Claus, the elephant for the GOP, and, and so on. And here he shows the United States in the form of Columbia. You know it's in Columbia pictures, right? The district of, I come from D.C. Uh, and can you see the chief doctor hand on the shoulders of African American? Can you see that? And he's in uniform. And I know you can see that he's on crutches and he's lost part of a leg. And she's saying, you don't see the caption, but the caption is, and not this man. And this is here in Harper's Magazine. 
part was still published as today, but in 1868 when this appeared, it was the most important magazine in America. It was the unofficial organ of the Republican Party. And every Harper's reader understands the meaning of this is, here we are giving back the right to vote and stand for office and be citizens to every white person, every confederate in the South except the top leadership. And now this man, who gave up his leg and maybe perhaps almost his life, on our behalf, on behalf of the United States, this is an outrage. So this is an argument for the 15th Amendment, right? The Voting Rights Amendment. And of course, the past. Well, that, that was then, that was during Reconstruction. During the Nader, these, the, 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 what did the Democrats do? They had just the opposite view. Now, this is hard for us to remember because, of course, the two parties split flop on this matter in, in 1964, finished the split flop. But in the 19th century, the Democrats were the overt party of white supremacy, right? Uh, they called themselves the white man's party. And here's their position in 1968. They are anti-Negro suffrage, says the Eagle. So they are against the 15th Amendment. All who are opposed to Negro equality, that's standing against the 14th Amendment. And congressional usurpations, blah, 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 come to our meeting. And in fact, every Democrat in Congress voted against every single civil rights measure ever introduced throughout the rest of the century, even if he was from the state of Maine. Well, this racism got to the Republicans, and it really got to them in 1890. We'll talk about it a little bit, but not too much. And so after 1890, these go up, these being Confederate monuments. And this is a key reason why Confederate monuments are, first of all, so bad in what they say, and second of all, why they're so being attacked. And I submit to you, they should be attacked. We luckily don't have any in Hastings. Uh, but they are all across, they were until two years ago, all across the North, in Helena, Montana, for example, Madison, Wisconsin. And there are all kinds of places in the South that are totally stupid. Uh, this is, an ex I took that picture, that's Cleveland, Mississippi, uh, in the Mississippi Delta. And what's stupid about it is it, the town didn't exist. There were no people living in, no white people anyway or black people living in Bolivar County when the Civil War was going on, they didn't have any Confederate dead. But that doesn't stop them from putting up a, a statue. And so these statues, almost all of them, go up between 1890 and 1940. Why? Because you put up statues after you win, right? If you don't believe that, go to Washington, D.C., where I live, and look at the Vietnam Memorial. How many of you see the Vietnam Memorial? Okay. That's an example. We lost that one. And that statue goes down, right? It is a gash in the earth. It is a memorial to the fallen. But it is not any kind of triumphal statue about our great victory in Vietnam. We didn't have one. Well, after 1890, the Confed I can't really call them Confederates. Let's say the Neo-Confederates, and that's why the book is called The Confederate and Neo-Confederate. It's a new generation. The Neo-Confederates won the Civil War. Now, I'm not making a joke here. I do like jokes, and I'll, make, and I'll love yours if you ask, ask, uh, say any. But I know it ended in 1865, but they won it in 1890. And one of the ways they won it is on the ground with these. And I'll give you just one example. Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky, you may remember, did not succeed. It had went in one city that uh, I would like to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. And this is a very interesting comment, and it has to do with why the, it's one of the reasons why the Emancipation Proclamation doesn't say anything about slavery in Kentucky, right? He's got to keep Kentucky on his side. Kentucky did send 35,000 troops to the Confederacy, but it sent 90,000 troops to the U.S., and it never succeeded. Today, Kentucky has 74 Civil War monuments. Two of them are for the United States, and 72 are for the Confederacy. So the Confederates got Kentucky, they got it after 1890. Does it make a difference? You betcha. When you have a Confederate landscape, it's a lot easier to have a Confederate mindset, shall we say a Confederate heart. These go to their all-time high. This is a photo of a lynching, right? And lynching is going to their all-time high between 1890 and 1940. A lynching is 
you understand it's the public work of an individual done with considerable support of the community. You can literally see this support. There's a bunch of nicely dressed men and women happily being photographed while they commit a felony. Why? Because they know, or at least they believe, and it turns out correctly in this case, that nothing will be done to them about it. Okay? And uh, this man happens to be black. You don't have to be black for a measure. The two thirds of the victims were. All right. This is my favorite picture of the nader, if you can imagine having a favorite picture of this thorough hero. And by the way, I've shown all of these pictures to kids as young as 50, and they can get them and they do a great job. So what do you see? Can you see that this little white boy is whipping this black man? Okay. And it says down at the bottom, get out, humble. And so I help my fifth graders, and I'll help you understand that, of course, this man is not his uncle. Uncle was a term of quasi respect that we used for older and more senior black folks, black males. We wouldn't want to say Mr. or Sir, because that would apply to fully human. So we said uncle, or for a female, we said auntie. We still have these terms, right? Uncle Ben is nice, aunt Jemima pancakes, or And the cream of weak people, in their infinite wisdom, in 1914, believed that this would make most Americans feel warm and friendly inside. Get out, Uncle. And they would like to buy their cereal. They probably knew their market. This goes to its all time high. Huh? This being Kilcock's plan, Roman numeral two, right? Roman numeral one was right after the Civil War, it was seven. Roman, this is a parade, of course, in D.C. Roman numeral II was in Minnesota. It was the largest meeting ever held in the history of Montpelier, Vermont, the state capital. Uh, it, recent, it briefly dominated the state government in Oklahoma, Oregon, Georgia, Indiana, Colorado. It was a national organization. Well, that's when this lie then uh, becomes so popular. What is the effect of our getting this wrong in this room? What is the effect of, we'll see what the students say tomorrow. I, I frankly hope that they beat the heck out of you and that 80% of them say slavery, and, and maybe they will. Um, otherwise, it makes us all stupid because we know something that didn't happen. You know, we know that the South succeeded for state trans, but it didn't. Or it succeeded for Paris and Texas, but it didn't. It also, if you think about it, minimizes the role of African Americans. Because if you think about it, the role black folks play in simply escaping from slavery, I'm not talking about bringing down Confederate governments or something, they didn't do that, but the, the simple role of escaping from slavery really hurt the white South in two ways. Uh, first of all, it hurt them economically. And in fact, the black slave in Maryland was worth about half as much as he or she was in Mississippi because he or she was less secure in Maryland, right? Might could escape. And second of all, it hurt them ideologically. Now, you know, your ideology is your way of how the world works, your understanding of how the social world works. And part of the, uh, the, the key part of the ideology of plantation slavery is racism. That is, it, it, it goes like this. I'm going to quote a famous French philosopher, uh, Marcy. I'm going to misquote him, but I don't think he'd mind. He says, and he's speaking ironically, he said, they, referring to black people, they must not be human, else we cannot be Christian. You understand? We would never do that to people like us, that weak slavery. But they are so inferior that they need to be told what to do. It's good for them, and they like it. Well, if they like it, then how come they keep escaping? You see, that hits you right in your ideology and, and makes you... Uh, it tries to make you think. It's hard, it's hard to avoid it. I, I said I would tell you a little bit about the underlying causes of the, of the Nader and why it happened in 1890. There are, I call the underlying causes the three I's because they each start with the letter I. And the first one is Indian Wars. I mean, here we are sitting doing reconstruction from 1866 until 1876 or so. And even after the construction during this confused era from 1876 to 1891, things could go either way and black folks are still voting. We're saying, 
We should give rights to everybody without regard to race. Unless you're Native American. Okay. And so we discover, you might think who we is in this sentence, we in this case, even includes black people. But we discover gold in the Dakotas and in Colorado, and we take it because they are not citizens, they Indians. Okay. Well, it's a little bit hard. You, you see the little cognitive dissonance setting in there? Okay. That's the first eye. The second eye is immigrants. And immigrants hurt our thinking. It wasn't their fault, but in the first on the West Coast. And these are Chinese, you can see them on the left hand side, Chinese male immigrants are coming in ever since 1850. They continue coming into Colorado. And California, they did come to Colorado to some extent, but I meant to say California, of course. Um, and the Republicans initially had this position. I mean, this, this is a mass cartoon again. And we see uh, the United States in the form of Colombia protecting this, this uh, Chinese immigrant from these horrible Democrats. And we know they're Democrats because they're ugly. Right? <laughs> um, this cost them so much, them being the Republicans at the polls, that California, which has been the most Republican state, rem uh, remarkably quickly, elects nothing but Democrats. So they give up on that. And then the immigrants are coming in from Europe through Ellis Island, and that hurts the Republicans too because the Democrats get their votes. How? Well, a couple of ways, but one of them is they offer racism. They say, you guys need jobs. Okay, well look, we got, and then they would use the N word I don't hear, uh, we got black folks um, working the wharf, right? Doing the teacher's job and so on. And they did little race riots fomented by the Democrats in Newark, in Baltimore, and so on, to drive black folks out of longshoremen positions or out of this job or that job, and turn it over to white folks. Okay? And so the white ethnic groups, the Polish and the Italians and so on, start voting Democrats. The Republican should have, maybe, I mean, in, in the best of all possibilities, they should have come back with straight anti-racism and saying this is wrong and you people shouldn't be uh, trying to influence the immigrants like that and the immigrants, you folks should vote with us because we're more authoritarian and for whatever reason you make their case. But instead they become anti-immigrant because those people are voting Democrats and we don't like them anyway, right? And so this is the movement towards WASP supremacy, right Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and this is the eugenics movement, okay? We even see it in things like the SAT. The SAT gets invented in 1922 or so, partly in order to give the Ivy League schools a rationale for excluding Jews. Now you might say, geez, I thought Jews did pretty well on the SAT. Well, not if you're born in Romania and you come to the United States when you're 11 years old and then you pick the SAT when you're 17 and you don't do so well. And so this keeps too many Jews out of Harvard and out of uh, Brown and out of Dartmouth and so on. So, the I is the second one, and the third I is imperialism. Now, we don't invent imperialism. It washes over us from Great Britain and from France and Germany, but we buy, even Russia, but we buy into it. And in particular, there is at least two of these in Minnesota. This is the Maltese Cross, which is at the bottom of the monument uh, for the Spanish American War. Okay? Uh, you have one of these in Minneapolis and a different one in St. Paul, I think. Um, and read it. It says, Spanish American War Veterans, 1898 to 1902. What's wrong with that? Did I see him? Somebody, what's wrong with that? You got a hand out there. That doesn't count. <laughs> Anybody? The war lasted that long? Yeah. The war lasted 91 days. Oh. How does it get five years? These aren't about that war. They only say they're about that war. They're really about our war upon the Philippines, which starts in 1899. We attack our own allies, the Philippines, who did most of the work of taking the Philippines. Spain deliberately surrendered to us because more seemingly for them to surrender to white folks than it was to surrender to Philippine colonials, shall we say. But they did most of the work. And on July 4th, 1902, 
President and then Teddy Roosevelt declared victory. Some people say the war went on for another 11 years. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> I might say some other war, but anyway. Uh, so that's the third eye. And the Democrats actually used this against the Republicans. They said, um, why are we intending to vote Eagles? They're setting up a democracy. And the Republican governor of the Philippines replied, quote, our little brown brothers our, are not ready for democracy. And the Democrats said, well, then what about our little black brothers in Mississippi and Alabama? The Republicans could make no cogent reply, right? So for those three reasons, those underlying reasons, in 1890, and the reason we dated specifically from 1890 is, at the end of 1893, things happened. What used to be called the Battle of Wounded Knee, but is now more accurately called the Massacre of Wounded Knee. And so Native Americans go into their nature for sure, but it means the last shards of their, of their independence. Second of all, Mississippi passes its new constitution in 1890. Nothing would ever wrong with its 1868 constitution, except that it lets black folks vote and be citizens. And in 1890, they had enough of that on white Democrats, and so they specifically set, set up a constitution openly designed to eliminate that. And the United States does nothing, even though it flies in the teeth of the 14th and 15th Amendments. And seeing that, every other show in the states as far away as Oklahoma follows suit by 1907. And third, the United States Senate fails to pass, more or less by a single vote, the Voting Rights Act, which is called the Federal Elections Act of 1890. Not a bad bill, not as good as the 1965 Act, but not bad. It had been passed by the House, it would have been signed by Republican President Benjamin Harrison, but it fails by a vote in the Senate. And after it fails, the Democrats tar the Republicans, as was their custom. And just a warning, I'm going to use the end word. I'm, of course, not using it. I'm quoting it because I want the Democrats to stand in their racism. Uh, they accused the Republicans of usually going nothing but a bunch of nigger brothers, they said. And the Republicans in the past had implied, you're darn right, somebody has to stand up for them. It's an outrage what you people are doing. The black voters are every fall election and the white Republicans too. But in 1891, they made a new reply. You remember what the charge was. I won't repeat it. The new reply was, no, we aren't. And they moved on to other issues. And African Americans were without serious political allies increasing after that. So the danger sets in. Well, let me show you a couple of more. Uh, let me just, let's get into the legacy of the nature that we're dealing with. Um, two legacies. I meant to put a question mark. I don't know what happened to it. There used to be a question mark right here because I didn't know what was going to happen. But I'm going to leave it alone because there was distorted history right in this room. And then the other legacy of the nadir is sundown towns. And of course, you folks are so far ahead of almost every other audience I've ever talked with. You already know what a sundown town is. Uh, it's defined by this sign. This is a sign at a sundown town city limits in Connecticut. Uh, this is an example from Missouri, um, a town in the Ozarks that drove out its black population in 1902. And this is a fire again. Uh, this, this is the fire of a cook. Uh, two people died in this fire. They didn't burn most of the houses. They just took them and drove 300 people out overnight. You guys didn't have 300, and they didn't get driven out in one night. But uh, as Rich and others, but especially Rich, I guess, have done, there's been good history on this. and, and uh, uh, so you know, well, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Rich talk about that. Uh, a couple of other pictures. Um, Norman, Oklahoma, that's where the university is. Uh, I'll, I'll just let you see the headline. Uh, it became the thing to do. This is uh, towns along the, the Ohio River in southern Indiana. It was also the thing to do in northern Indiana. This is not a southern phenomenon. And a lot of you don't uh, uh, understand that, I know, because I was talking with some folks before we, uh, when we were just talking. Uh, southern towns are very rare in the south. They're white southerners thought this is ridiculous. Who's going to be the maid? People don't even know how to learn race relations. And they actually have a point. Uh, so that comes from a northern phenomenon, okay? They're very rare in the South. Well, how many? When I went to do this research, I decided to do it in, 18, in 1899. 
Actually, 1999. Uh, just after I finished this book, I wrote called Lines Across America, which talks about Confederate monuments and other monuments, not just Confederate ones. Uh, I grew up in Illinois, as Rich mentioned. Uh, and so I knew I would do more research in, this, in Illinois than in any other single state. I thought I would discover maybe 10 of these towns in Illinois, and maybe 50 across the United States. I had no idea. Uh, I had a high experience at a certain talk in my, in my hometown in Decatur, Illinois, right in central Illinois, that convinced me otherwise. And I learned so much. I am now at a count of 506 sundown towns in Illinois alone, which is two thirds of all the towns there are in Illinois. And I think a similar fraction went sundown in Oregon, Indiana, and various other northern states. I lived in Mississippi for years, so I tried to identify every sundown town I could in Mississippi. I found five. That compares to 506 in Illinois. How many of you have seen this movie, The Green Book? A bunch of you. This is astounding. This interesting couple drives to Indiana, where there's at least 400 sundown towns, across Illinois, where there's 506, into Iowa, where there's over 200. Never comes up with a sundown. And then they go to St. Louis. Finally, they end up in Mississippi, where they find a sundown. Now, eight, but, well, there's actually only three independent sundown towns. The other two are suburbs, and they weren't sundown at that time. So it's really only three. And they find a sundown. Why is that? Because Hollywood knows, of course, that severe racism. That's in Mississippi. That's in Alabama. They, this is what we in sociology call BS. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad sociology. <laughs> Can I use that joke in high school? I won't get to an hour in high school. <laughs> well, anyway, all right, to be serious about it, and where are they? Well, in Minnesota, we don't really know because so little research has been done on it. You folks have proven it for Hastings. Uh, I found other sources that proved it for Austin and Hidden and some other towns around the state and a couple of suburbs of Minneapolis and St. Paul, but I suspect that 80% of the suburbs of Minneapolis and St. Paul were sundown towns, and that there's also sundown towns sprinkled all over the place in, in Minnesota. And that was one of the reasons why I gave a workshop yesterday uh, up at the Historical Society to try to get some folks to get their students studying this across Minnesota so that we can start confirming these towns so that they can start facing their pasts. Hmm. How do they stay sundown even today? Well, reputation. I mean, people, I'll, I'll give you an example of the rich, some people think it's the richest suburb in the United States, which is Canada, North Illinois, and it's on the lake, just north of Chicago, just north of Everest, it's the next town north. And Canada is basically a sundown town today. It's had two black families, one of them lasted three months, and one of them lasted 12 years. But as far as I know, it doesn't have any black families right now. And people will tell you things like, oh yeah, well, they just don't have the, the money yet. So I did research on that. There are 7,000 black families in the Chicago metropolitan area that make more money than the average family in Kenilworth. And yet not one of them lives in Kenilworth. So that's another example of BS. Um, okay. But everybody knows that Kenilworth is a sundown town it was. And so people don't want to move there, don't want to try. Okay. And the same is true for, for uh, rural towns in the Midwest. Uh, so if you don't do anything to counter it, well then the tradition continues. And that's why it's important that you folks are doing stuff to counter it. And there's also, I'm going to use that third point to make this turn, to tell you about this turn. Second generation sundown town problems. Connection with business as usual. Uh, Ferguson, Missouri was briefly a sundown town, for example. You've heard of Ferguson? Right? You have to live in a cave if you have another Ferguson. And yet, and so Ferguson is now two thirds black, so it's turning over it, right? Well, yes and no. It still has, it's sundown, or it had, until at the time of the racial disturbances, it had a sundown town police force, right? Overwhelmingly white, with overwhelmingly white practices. I suspect it had an overwhelmingly white teaching staff, too, and an overwhelmingly white curriculum. Oh, you've got to fix these things. These are second generation problems. The town, Edina is no longer a sundown town, but it still has some sundown town second generation problems. 
Within cities, you get this problem, uh, and there's good research on this now for Minneapolis. Uh, this is when cities go segregated between 1890 and 1940. They weren't segregated between eight, before 1890, astoundingly enough. Uh, but by, by 1940, they sure were, and it got worse and worse and worse until 1970. It's now slowly getting better. Can you read the restrictions? Okay, protective, but not prohibitive, BS, restrictions ensure all owners Blah, blah, blah. No portion of this tract shall ever be at any time used or occupied by any but the white or Caucasian race. This is, I think, my final, well, no, almost my final shot. Uh, sundown towns are a part of this intensely racist era, the nadir of race relations. And I show you this Tarzan cartoon to indicate how racist we were. First of all, let's look at it physically. He's walking over the heads of a bunch of black people, right? Maybe a little white supremacy there? Mm -hmm. Second of all, if you had seen the three previous panels, you realize that these folks are facing some jungle animals. And they don't know, these residents of Africa, for God's sake, don't know what to do. But this white man knows just what to do, plus he's got the courage. If he could just get past the close pressed horde to go face the danger, okay? Pretty vicious. And the other interesting thing about it is the first three Tarzan books were written in a sundown suburb of Chicago. Edgar Rice Mills then made so much money off of them that he moved to Los Angeles where he used the proceeds from the movies to create his own sundown suburb of Los Angeles called Tarzan. It's a great country. Well, what to do about it? First of all, confirm them, and you folks have done that for Hastings. Show it, prove it. You may have to use oral history. You guys have written some written sources that are terrific. Um, get them to change. I suggest what I call the low and three-step program. Uh, admit it, apologize, and change. Um, we did this, and it was wrong, and we're sorry, and we don't do it anymore. And that third step needs to have teeth. We're making a special efforts to hire black policemen, black garbage men, and women, and black teachers, or whatever you're making a special effort to. And we're going to house them in the city, or at least try to. Well, as soon as you do things like that, then clearly nobody can say you're a son downtown. Um, I want to close by just showing you what I've been using, the quote I've been using for the last three years for my emails. Because it, because it sums up my last work, and, and maybe it may might sum up yours, or you just have to do it. Um, I think there's a reciprocal relationship between the past and the present. I think telling the truth about the past helps cause justice in the present. In this case, telling the truth about a town being a sundown now is the first step toward achieving justice in the present. And then I think achieving justice in the present helps us to tell the truth about the past. Uh, I can see that in textbooks, for instance, which do a good job of talking about our incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. But then we did stop it, didn't we? And we even made amends, we even were attracted. We paid reparations in the Reagan and George H. W. Bush administrations. And so we made it an American success story to the degree we could. So now we can face it openly. So there's this reciprocal relationship. And, and it, what it does is it means there's an opening for you all to make a difference. If you get history right at Hastings High School, at Hastings Middle School, if you get the story of uh, he sees past as a sundown town accurate and out there, then they will find it easier to make progress on racial lines and on all kinds of other social justice lines today, and vice versa. Let's see if I have one more slide. Well, I do. I often close with that slide. Um, when I get attacked, which is not too much, people say, why do you always focus on the bad thing, which I don't. But, and they call me unpatriotic, and I want to suggest that this happens to you. There's a distinction to be made between patriotism and nationalism. And I take my discussion, my definition of patriotism from a guy in the 19th century named Frederick Douglass, you might have heard of him. Uh, he said something like this. Now, pardon his male pronouns, he was damn good on women's rights too, but this is how everybody talked in America until about 30 years ago. He says, I call him a true patriot 
who rebukes his country for its sins and does not excuse them. Okay? And I think that's right. And I think a nationalist, on the other hand, is somebody who says, what do you mean, guys? We don't doubt those things. And if you think we do, I'm going to hit you upside the head with this four, nine-pound American history textbook. I made that part up. More than five and a half pounds. Um, I submit to you, we don't need nationalism. In fact, I submit to you, nationalism is not patriotic. Thanks for your attention, and now we're going to have a really fascinating part of the evening for me as we hear from two or three people who know the story here in Houston. Thank you. Kids are going to laugh at me because I'm not quite sure how to get back to my James. Which one? That's this one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. There it is. We're going to have a uh, um, a bit of a. Uh, uh, addition to the uh, to the agenda. Do you want to talk now, or should we do the town first? Should I do? I will do the history first. So I'm going to uh, do a brief history of um, uh, Black uh, Hastings Black history, and it's very interesting that I set this up in exactly the same way that Dr. Lowen was talking about it today. We're going to talk about three stories of uh, three generations of uh, black community leaders in Hastings, um, so we can kind of zero in on their agency and then talk a little bit more about, um, about uh, the, the actions and reactions of the town of Hastings. Um, this is a picture of Thomas Willis, who was, the, um, um, was a, uh, on the first Hastings football team in 1898 and Hastings had a winning season. They were five and one. Um, this is a story of three, um, uh, essentially three families. We're going to talk about uh, A.J. Overalls, we're going to talk about John and Nancy Wallace, and we're going to talk about the Currys. Uh, this uh, uh, spring, um, we had an event at Lakeside Cemetery um, celebrating the marking of, um, you know, where we were able to um, acquire monuments to mark some unmarked black graves at the cemetery. And through the efforts of Heidi Langenfeld that we were able to make connections with some of those descendants of the Curry and Wallace families. That's a picture of those folks. This is one of those gentlemen here, and he's going to be adding some comments um, in a little bit. Um, Andrew Jackson Overalls was born in Indiana in 1817. It was already a state, and it was a free state. His father um, was a um, member of the um, Underground Railroad in Indiana. At any rate, he came to Hastings in 1857, was probably the second black person living in Hastings at the time. He was a barber by trade, um, but he was a very skilled leader and organizer. Um, when he got to Hastings, um, and at this point, um, oh, I don't remember my Minnesota history exactly when they became, Minnesota became a state, 1858, thank you, um, the, the Constitution at that point did not allow black men the right to vote. And uh, so the black community in Hastings nominated A.J. to um, write a petition um, 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 to be taken to the state legislature um, petitioning for the right to vote. Um, his petition, along with petitions from the uh, cities of Rochester and from Winona, Winona were delivered to the state legislature. Um, the effect that they had on, on the legislature, I don't know, but I do know that um, the state of Minnesota did pass um, black suffrage 
two years before the federal government did. Um, in addition to those sorts of activities, um, he was also a statewide leader in the Sons of Freedom, which was a statewide organization dedicated to black empowerment and self-help. He organized a black temperance society in Hastings. And he even politicked for your um, Ulysses S. Grant um, as he ran for re-election um, in 1872. John and Nancy Wallace was the next generation of, of black leaders. And, um, and again, I, I show a picture of the headstone because there are no photos um, that exist of, of these two. Um, they began their lives as slaves in Tennessee. John was born approximately, um, or somewhere around 1830, we're not quite sure. Um, and the Hastings Pioneer Room records record only that John was an escaped slave. And since we've made connections with the, uh, with the descendants of the Wallaces and Currys, we've learned a little bit more information that is, is dramatic and compelling. Um, John was a slave one hot day, he was laboring in the fields, and he asked the overseer for permission to get a drink of water. And the overseer denied him the opportunity to get a drink of water again and again and again. So finally, um, John went and got that drink of water and refreshed, went over to the overseer, struck him, and killed him. And um, Obviously then, he was an escaped slave and he headed north, um, and he joined Company F of the Minnesota 3rd Infantry. Um, it wasn't too much later that the Minnesota 3rd lost a battle to um, General Nathan Bedford Forrest. They surrendered, it was um, um, highly embarrassing, and they actually became then um, um, uh, prisoners of war. Um, a sidebar here, Nathan Bedford Forrest became the first Grand Wizard of the KKK. Um, Dr. Lowen talked about the first KKK and the second. This would have been the first KKK. So um, there was a prisoner exchange. Um, the Minnesota 3rd um, was brought back to Iowa, or excuse me, Minnesota, and um, that's how John made his way. And finally he uh, um, ended up in Hastings. Um, he purchased the freedom for his wife and his two sons. He arranged for a white man to transport those two, uh, or those three people, um, north. And something happened when they were in St. Louis. Um, one of the sons was taken away. And uh, was he kidnapped? Was he resold into slavery? We don't know but there were weeks of searching, yielded no information, and finally, Nancy and her son, remaining son James, made their way to join John and Hastings. Son James grew up, married, moved next door to his parents, and he had seven children. And the names of um, John and James Wallace and Jim Curry, who we're gonna be talking about in a moment, are featured, um, um, uh, in the founding documents for Brown's Chapel, the American Methodist Episcopal Church um, in Hastings. John died in 1900. This is a picture of the Currys. Um, Jim Curry was um, born uh, to a free, poor farm family in Virginia in 1859. Um, he and his wife, Ella, moved to Hastings in 1885. The reason the Currys came to Hastings was that Ella Curry was the niece of Nancy Wallace. And uh, you could apply a lot of um, adjectives to Jim. I chose uh, energetic, resourceful, and joyful. Um, everyone loved Jim. Jim and Ella had 10 children nine of which graduated from high school, including one high school valedictorian. Several of his children went on for additional education. The last 15 years of his life, Jim served as the high school janitor. He died at, in 19, 
33 at the age of 83, and the businesses and schools in Hastings closed to attend his funeral. It was a packed house at the Methodist Church. Um, and now we'll move on to a few of the things, uh, some of, I think, the important events in Hastings. I'm not going to read this. I'm going to allow you to read it. Um, the Hastings, the Pioneer Room has documented, I think, every newspaper clip clipping available about uh, references to our black citizens early on. Most of them were objective, small-town newspaper stories. Some were, were very warm and very positive. There were two that were just plain mean and ugly. And this is one of them. Um, I, well, you, you need to see it. I, I, you know, I've tried to think what it would be like to be a member of the black community in Hastings, get this newspaper, and then have to go do your job downtown Hastings the next day. Brown's Chapel. Um, up to this point, uh, most of the African American citizens worshiped at the Methodist Church. Um, and then in December 26, 1891, um, there was this notice in the paper, and by the way, this is, I think, the only picture that we are aware of, of the congregation of Brown's Chapel. Um, in 1891, uh, there was this notice in the paper, experience has taught us the necessity of having a place of our own where we may become permanently situated and worship God according to the dictates of our own consciousness without shame or fear. And the letter closed with a request for donations to raise $200 for a down payment. The community also helped um, uh, Brown's Chapel meet its loan payments occasionally. So the city rose to the occasion to help the black citizens form their own church. Um, and, and then at that point, um, in 1892, they're ready to open the church. There's, this invitation went out. Um, it was posted in the newspaper inviting the community to participate. They, um, and they purchased, excuse me, um, they purchased a, a, a building at Fifth and Sibley, um, and um, when it opened, um, they had um, choir members from black congregations in St. Paul and Minneapolis come down. Um, and uh, ministers from neighboring churches because, you know, in this part of town, um, there are a lot of churches. So they had um, the Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, and uh, um, did not participate. Uh, Baptist um, um, participated um, in the opening services. They had three services that day. Um, in 1907, um, there was this notice that appeared in the newspaper. There was fire at the African Methodist Episcopal Church. There is no doubt that it was the work of an incendiary. Um, and what it means is that it was arson. And the curious thing about this is that, you know, we've already demonstrated that there was this track record of community support for this church. Um, not only community support, because they raised several hundred dollars to get this church going and to help um, this small congregation maintain their church, but then there were there other neighboring churches in the neighborhood who, you know, were willing and able to participate. Well, um, the church is um, uh, torched, and it's not destroyed, but it is unusable. Um, but there is no record of an investigation there is no record of any church or individual offering assistance to Brown's Chapel. Um, and I just, this is why I was confused and this is why I was looking for a person like James Lowen to explain this to me. So, you know, how is it that this town who had a track record of supporting, um, um, you know, this group of people somehow their hearts had hardened, and why was that? Um, and it should be noted that uh, the burning of black chur churches already had a long history in the, in, in the United States. There were four black church burnings 
in Philadelphia between the years of 1825 um, to 1850, and four people died in those. In those um, so burning a church already back then meant something. So um, the church, um, uh, they lost their legs, they disbanded, and most of the members returned to the Methodist church to worship. The Klan, um, in the 1920s, um, the second iteration of the Klan was in its ascendancy, and the Klan was very strong um, in Hastings. Um, this is, uh, a, it's not an exact copy of, obviously I just um, um, copied the headline, Klan gathers at Sorg Farm. The biggest assembly of hooded ever at this vicinity is held in Nininger. 800 cars parked at the farm, 800 cars. They estimate the crowd to be about 1,200 people. Um, the, and this was the second of two um, rallies. The other big rally was in 1925 um, in town. Um, it, actually, there was some violence involved. Um, they tried to burn a cross within the town, and the, uh, the mayor stood their, their ground and refused to allow them to do it, and they had to take the cross burning out of town. Um, it's interesting to note that at both these rallies, the Reverend W.E. Thompson offered the closing prayer, and he was the Hastings United Methodist Minister in 1925. And in 1926, he moved on to Stanton, Minnesota. Here's um, the... Hastings census data, and again, this is provided by Heidi Langenfeld and the um, Pioneer Room, but you can see in 1857, we started with one um, um, uh, black citizen, and by 1870, following the Civil War, we're up to 40, and then it kind of hangs for the next number of years in that 30 to, um, you know, range, and then by 1920, it drops to 10. By 1950, it drops to 1. And um, so take a look at those numbers and then take a look at what happens um, for the overall um, Hastings population numbers. And then in 1954, um, this notice appeared in the Hastings paper. Um, Henry Thomas, 74, the city's only Negro resident, died. And um, thus we close 97 years of Hastings black history. Um, you can read more about this, and it's, this is all research and writing um, that Heidi, um, Heidi Langenfeld has done. Um, and we have, um, at Lakeside Cemetery, we've got a, a Black History Month link um, and you can read her articles on, on um, our black history. It's quite interesting. And of course, there's always more information in the Pioneer Room. Um, I've got to get a big shout out to, um, to uh, um, Heidi and to um, uh, James Curry, who is going to be speaking here in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, do you mind? Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thank you so much for coming out today. Um, I've got a cousin I want to acknowledge right off the bat, the Wallace. Um, fourth cousin, Greg McMore. <laughs> and his wife, Heather. <laughs> It's really only because of um, an errant uh, email that I was able to uh, connect with Rich um, and then sort of be a part of the uh, lakeside um, uh, ceremony that we had at, uh, not ceremony, but coming together that we had in May. And um, I just wanted to 
thank Rich and Heidi for that connection. It's cool. We always knew, we, the Currys always knew that there was Hastings roots. I had never really made any um, pilgrimage to the town before. Uh, although my brother and I used to ski at Afton Alps, um, which, which isn't really um, Hastings, but I remember the old sign. And oddly enough, I, I don't have anything as dramatic as um, killing an overseer with a bucket. But one of the more overt uh, incidents of racism growing up uh, happened on the slopes at Afton Alps where I was with a, an Irish friend, Chad McIntyre, and uh, we were getting sort of um, harassed as we went up the, uh, the lift. And uh, there was a uh, couple guys ahead of us on the lift, uh, ahead of us that said that we were gonna get it once we got up to the top. And sure enough, when they got off, they had their um, ski poles held like uh, bat bats. And, took one hit at um, my friend and he went down and then I, I got away, but uh, ultimately after rolling down the hills, I got a, a pole uh, gouged into the, my temple. Um, I don't know if that was um, purely racially motivated, uh, but there weren't a lot of black skiers in the 80s. Um, maybe there aren't that many now, but um, uh, I digressed. I just thought I'd throw that in there um, as something that did stand out. And I don't know if it subconsciously kept me away from going to Southern Minnesota, but um, I was born and raised in Brooklyn Park, uh, just outside of the Twin Cities, which is now affectionately called Brooklyn Dark, um, along with my high school known as Dark Center, which is Park Center. Uh, I, I think that, that um, that creeping racism, uh, you know, if, if, if it has to meet a, I remember just being one of eight or nine blacks in, in my high school. Um, and I don't know if there's a tipping point, but um, basically uh, those communities became um, full of um, folks of color as the 90s and the late 80s um, progressed. Uh, my father and mother being an interracial couple uh, bought their home in 68 um, in, in the suburbs and there were petitions to um, keep them out. But um, uh, I think there was a realtor and the homeowner that uh, persevered and allowed, um, which was by law, uh, their, them to purchase their home. And um, I don't think I want to run down the whole history, but we'd always grown up the Currys, um, knowing that my father had roots in South Minneapolis, my mother roots in Wyzetta, and the Currys uh, and their roots in, in Hastings. So it's, it's just been a pleasure uh, this past year to sort of make connections. And I'm so honored to have uh, Dr. Lowen here to speak and uh, give greater context to it. So, um, Let's, let's follow those last three steps of uh, Dr. Lowen's and um, make this a, a better union, I suppose. All right, thanks. Well, now we are gonna talk about step three and um, Mark Zuzik, please. He's going to talk a little bit about Hastings or Thrive Hastings and where we go from here. Pretty tough show to follow. Let me just start by saying that. Um, wow, powerful. It was very, very powerful. I, Winston Churchill gets credit, although he's not the first person to have said the phrase that those that don't learn from their history are doomed to, to repeat it. It was actually uh, first said by George Santana. And and that's part of what we're what we're doing here. Of course. Hastings has a history of, you know, we've, we've seen some very overt racism. And we also know that we're not the only community 
like this, where, where there have been problems. And as a school administrator in Hastings, I noticed two trends that were really significant. One was, as I would go to, to meetings and learn how things were going in other communities, I was hearing just some horrific stories about the way that, that children of color and families of color were being treated in other communities. And the second trend was we were looking at our demographics in Hastings and we have been very steadily increasing in the percentage of our student body who are children of color. And I wanted to make sure, I want to make sure, we want to make sure that we don't repeat those same sins from the past and we don't walk down the same rugged roads that so many other communities have had to, had to struggle with in welcoming people that are different from the people that have lived in the community for a long time. And so with that partial context and with another piece of context is that we all know that people are different in very many ways in who they love, in how they identify, in the, the wealth in their family or the socioeconomic struggles that they have, the color of their skin, their ethnic groups, and we need to make sure that all people are welcome because it's good for people, it's good for families, it's good for schools, and it's good for a community. So a group of interrupt, well, thank you. A group of interested citizens, and I think that it's important to note that, it, it, they, that not all of the people that have been really deeply involved in Thrive are in formal leadership positions. One of the most impressive, and I think that one of the, the things that will help it to be an enduring action is that there, there are people that come from all walks of life that have expressed an interest in being involved. And so we've come together over the last three years to try to understand our diversity accurately and to build the capacity of the community to provide equity and include all people fully. And so you would be wondering, I'm sure, well, what are some of the ways that we can do that? And I would just comment that, uh, that the Hastings Thrive is a grassroots effort of passionate citizens, organizations, and leaders over the past three years with leadership from the city, the city council and the school district have made a joint declaration and uh, have written a resolution about providing equity and access to all people. And also a huge leadership role by the YMCA. The city and the school district have, have both contributed $20,000 each to the effort and that's a great start. The YMCA has contributed over $50,000 in in-kind services and training. And they're, they're, they're really very involved in the leadership role and I cannot thank the, the Y enough for that. Some of the things you can do, as Rich said, there, there are buckets on the way out for a free will donation uh, to, to help to, to cover the, the, the cost of today's program. And then this is just one of the speakers that will be presenting one of the presentations that will happen throughout the community over the course of this year. We have a speaker series and each month there's an event. To find out more about these and other educational opportunities, the Hastings City webpage has a link to Thrive. And again, this is, this is so important. I, I just know that we can't teach our history if we don't know it. And this is part of what we can do to make sure that we don't repeat it. <laughs>